Morning, everybody, and welcome to Madden Ben's Unfiltered, brought to you by Alter Genius Brewing Company. Try their brilliantly crafted brews and enjoy their full kitchen at their brewery in Ambridge. I was just there this weekend. It's great first time there. You got to check it out. You can also go to their trailside tap room on the Montour Trail in Imperial. Mention Madden Ben's Unfiltered. Get yourself a free small pour on the house. Also brought to you by the Barber School of Pittsburgh, locations on Banksville Road and in Monroeville. Day and night classes available and rolling now at bsp.edu. Barber School, yes, Google Barber School of Pittsburgh, bsp.edu. Mark and I, we talked at length on the Madden Ben's Unfiltered, the Madden Monday podcast today over at Trib Live. About a number of different topics. Mark, we didn't dive too much into the specifics of the Pirates game itself yesterday because it was wrapping up as we were taping up. That last inning lasted forever because they couldn't get out of it. Uh, The bullpen had been spent over the previous couple of days. Holderman and Bednar both pitched four out of five games. They had a bullpen game the day before. I know Jones wasn't sharp early. Why not push him at least one morning to try to cover some of that? Well, yeah, you, you look at it in general terms, Tim. Um, you're going to have a loss like that every so often when you have your starters on such a tight pitch count and when you do have the occasional bullpen day. You're just going to run out of bullpen, and that's what happened in extra innings in the 10th inning uh, when the Pirates lost the Twins yesterday. You just have to accept it. Um, you can you can, you can, know, have your pitchers, your starters go longer if you want, I suppose, but they're just not going to. I think they're prepared to absorb a loss like that every so often. And they could have easily won in nine innings, too. So I'm not seeing it as too big a deal. But then again, when you're in a tight race for a wild card like they are, indeed a race just to finish with a winning record, every win counts. Yeah, I just think they're trying to live in that gray area, that netherworld, where they're trying to accomplish both things at the same time. They're trying to protect the arms of the young starters, namely Jones and Skeens. And they're also trying to get everything they possibly can out of their bullpen, but you can't have it both ways. You can't protect the starter's arms and at the same time protect the bullpen because you're just going to run out of innings, and they're running into that situation now. Well, that's right. But given the stance they've chosen, you know, letting the bummy guy stay in there to get his nipples knocked off, that's just what you do there. I don't have any problem. Not not that part. I have a problem with them having to use the bummy guys as much as they are because – they're using Holderman and Bednar four out of every five days. Yeah, but they won two out of three against the Twins. They won two out of three against the Dodgers. They're half game out of the last wild card. Right now, I don't have a complaint. Uh, do you have a complaint at all about the officiating, the umpiring in that game, and how the Pirates went through the machinations of maybe trying to get that call in their favor? I'm tired of talking about officiating in sports. Uh, they have replay and still can't get everything right. So. What, what's the point of discussing until they go to an automated strike zone? I just, it's, it's fruitless to discuss. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I hear what you're saying about the strike zone. I just think Shelton could have handled the machinations of what to do better because he could have maybe challenged that it was a hit by pitch. And then if he challenges, it's a hit by pitch. Oh, right. Then the ball doesn't get to the backstop and all. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's, I don't know that. I mean, that's, I mean, I get it. I'm going back and looking at it with, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm going back and looking at it with 2020 vision. I get it, but it's still, I think, worth the shot and something they could have done because where it goes from there, Mark, is that brings up the pitch count and it gives Jones a really tough high leverage inning early in the game. And that's why he's pulled when he's pulled. Yeah. In in retrospect, but again, I, I just, I'm not going to panic or or nitpick that loss yesterday too much. I, I think generally they're doing pretty good. Although, Every time they lose a start by Jones or Skeens, uh, that that is going to hurt at the end of the season. That's going to hurt in the final standings. Then again, right now their best pitcher is Mitch Keller, Tim. Nobody told Mitch Keller he's not allowed to be their best pitcher. Yeah, right. We've spent how many years now saying he might be a two or a three and he's not an ace, but now they have two potential aces and he's the one that's pitching like an ace, ironically well, enough. Well, don't you think that's at least partly because now when he pitches, it's just another day? There's no pressure on him. There's no attention on him starting, and he just goes out and throws. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Jones and Skeens wear a little some of that for each other as well. Um, you know, there's 
a draw to both of them. It's not all about one guy all the time. And I do think Keller is better served kind of being in that sphere as opposed to being a potential number one. I do think he benefits from that quite a bit. Yes. No, no question. And, and he fits well. I mean, this stuff where, what is it now, 44 games of at least five innings? That, that is very much, I think you said it first, Tim, it's kind of like that A-B record for five catches for 90 yards or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. It's a totally made-up record that means almost nothing, except in today's era, on that team with that staff and that bullpen, it does mean something. Yeah, for the reasons we just pointed out, if he can be an innings eater, and even in games when he's not the sharpest, if he can eat some of them, um, maybe, you know, we've talked a lot about trying to break up Skeens and Jones, no. um, you know, Falter's a candidate to do that, I guess, but maybe Keller could be as well because it's not like he's the exact same pitcher as those guys. He doesn't. Let me let me tell you what they should do right now, Tim. Hmm. Right now, they should bring Trevor Bauer in from the Mexican League. If they bring Trevor Bauer in right now, they make the playoffs. Period. All right, I want to hear some comments from Pirates fans. Let's get those comments going. I see some coming in already. On well, Tim, I would, I would figure he'd bring back like sombreros and burros and <laughs> brightly colored pinatas. I think it would be great. I mean, there'd be a Kenny Powers element to everything going on in the dugout, wouldn't you think? Either that or Fez from that 70s show. <laughs> well, you know, hey, speaking of controversial signings, the Steelers... Oh, no, Tim, you're right, actually. If, if, if uh, Trevor Bauer came in, I would call him La Flama Blanca on every <laughs> reference, every single one. Uh, speaking of controversial signings, Mark, I mean, I wouldn't see the controversy so much in Bauer. Some people see it in Sutton uh, coming on board with the Steelers. I know you don't, though. You didn't seem to have a problem with that signing. No. I mean, he, <clears throat> excuse me. he's accused of doing something real bad. The police complaint is terrible. He bargained onto a misdemeanor. Uh, he was always an exemplary citizen here in Pittsburgh. I just say it's good. He, he plugs the hole. And you don't see much outrage here in Pittsburgh, do you? Just like you did for Harrison stuff. Yeah, I feel or, like. Or Mike Vicks. Well, there you go. I mean, I feel like anything post Ray Rice seems to just not rise to that level of debate anymore. I think we debated the hell out of it back then. And we know what the um, level to which something has to rise to get them to the point where they're going to blackball a guy, and that's video, I guess. And if there's no video, then that seems to be the tipping point. Well, tell me what's supposed to happen here. Is everybody accused of domestic violence supposed to never play in the league again? Because it sounds to me that's what the guys like Mike Florio want. Oh, well, Florio's the guy that's raising the biggest stink about it. Yeah, for right, sure. Right, he wants him to never play in the league again. That's what it sounds like, right? Sure sounded that way to me. Yeah, he wants to shame whoever's going to sign him and give him a chance, that's for sure. Is, isn't that a little impractical? I mean, when there's no legal process to dictate that he, I mean, Tim, he's getting like what? Like like probation, community service? I mean, like a misdemeanor. Well, that is the irony of uh, Florio, of all people, taking that stance. I mean, he's why does Mike Florio get to supersede the legal system? Well, that's the thing. Like his he's whole a lawyer. Yeah, right, exactly. So he probably he, not a very good one. He just wants the legal system to be on his side when it's convenient. He just wants people to say what a morally upright guy Mike Florio is. And as a lawyer, I guarantee that's not the case. Um, now, what about what you just said on the field stuff, Mark, him plugging a hole? You know, with mini camps coming up, one thing I'm writing about is all the questions that are, you know, for a change, you get to throw them at the assistant coaches themselves. We don't get to do that a bunch covering the Steelers. But one of them is, like, I, I want to know exactly how these secondary pieces are going to be parsed out for the Steelers and what that means in terms of how much nickel and dime they're going to play. Uh, maybe Peyton Willis, the linebacker, cures a lot of this because they could play more nickel with him and Patrick Queen, and they don't have to rely on the defensive backs as much. I think it's easy not, Tim. I, I think they play mostly nickel and dime, and Jackson plays outside, and Sutton plays inside, Porter on the other side. You know, it, and... You know, you got a decent group of safeties. I think they're secondary. If if Minka can play up to his previous level and not last year, if he can get involved in takeaways again, then it's a decent secondary. The other question to ask is, why can't Dan Moore play right tackle and why won't they try to teach him to do so? Tim, it is the biggest piece of coaching malpractice by a coach that I don't think is a very good coach in the first place. First off, making Jones the swing tackle is inconveniencing the better player for the sake of the lesser player, 
which is ridiculous. Second off, Moore looking like the starter is absurd. You drafted two tackles in the first round. It's not that difficult. Just start both of them. This is badly getting overcomplicated. And it's not like Dan Moore is, is some phenom. All the metrics you can come up with for left tackle indicate that he's not very good. And he's done at the end of the year anyway. No way he's signing a second contract in Pittsburgh. I, I don't think. No, why would you sign somebody that you just tried to replace twice and somebody who can't be the backup because he can't play more than one side? Uh, you used except, to phrase- except they're not replacing him. No, I'm saying next year. Next year, when he's why, why would they bother to extend him? To your point, is what I'm saying. But maybe they will, oh. because they keep drafting guys to replace them, and they don't replace them. Yeah, well, um, if he can't swing as a backup, then absolutely he shouldn't be kept, and they can have somebody else do that. Just anybody else can do that job, I think. Um, you're making Broderick Jones be the swing guy, and he's one of the starters, which to me is kind of silly. And you're asking a lot. You're putting a lot on his plate, and only his second year. Tim, seriously, this whole thing is just remarkably stupid. It, it, like People talk about what a great coach Tomlin is. You want to argue the other way, point at this. It is remarkably stupid. Let's get to something you said on the podcast, Mark, because I think it's worth um, diving into a little bit more here on Unfiltered, and that is you've kind of talked yourself into thinking that Russell Wilson's going to have a decent season. Yeah, I'm probably full of crap. <laughs> well, what, what you, should I you be to, different I than I forgot to clean else. my glasses before this, so I'm looking through myself <laughs> at myself through blurry eyes and my hair is not good. I look like a prisoner of war, Tim. So I'll right, get you to the barber school of Pittsburgh and they'll clean you right up. You could be somebody's final exam. No, I got my hair cut by my, my regular guy on, uh, on, uh, on Friday. I just didn't prepare. But you know, for this. I, I think when I get your, your overall point that he's going to be better than what he was in Denver and him being better than he was in Denver is going to be better than what they got last year. When they were seven and seven, it's just can he be as good as what Rudolph was the last three games, which would definitely be good enough to get him to the playoffs. Then, still, though, I don't know if it's good enough to win a playoff game, which is what we're looking for to be the difference anyway. Well, no, but if you wanted to win a playoff game, you would have finished five and 12 a few years ago. Yeah. I mean, Russell Wilson will be as good as Rudolph the last few games, I think. And I think he'll be effective in the red zone. And I think he will make best use of minimal weaponry. I think his experience and resourcefulness will allow him to do that. Hockey Mark, let's get to some talk there as the Stanley Cup finals are underway. I walked away from game one just marveling at Bobrovsky in the game that he played. I, I thought we discussed this in the right vein on the podcast, which is if you get that from Bobrovsky, then Edmonton doesn't really have a shot. But then again, Edmonton did control a lot of the flow of play if you look at the total scope of things. Yeah, I mean, I thought Edmonton played really good. They just couldn't score. Uh, Bobrovsky was brilliant. Skinner played okay. The, the first two goals, the guy was wide open, including Evan Rodriguez for the second goal, formerly of this parish, which, yeah. I mean, what a great finish. Um, Evan Rodriguez is one of those guys, if you never touch him, he's pretty good. And on that team, there's a lot more guys to worry about traffic-wise than him. Right, yeah. So, so uh, full credit to Rodriguez. So, uh, I mean, tonight's the key game. That goes without saying. But if Edmonton doesn't win tonight, I think, I think they're cooked. I think best case scenario, uh, Florida bleeds it out in six if they win tonight. Mark, they've got about thirteen million dollars of cap space. The Penguins do. How do you see them using that? Is that like? A couple of uh, five million guy, five million dollar guys up front, and then maybe a defenseman for like the bottom pairing. I think it depends who they can get with their first signing, the guy they want most. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if they would get a Max Domi or a Tyler Bertuzzi. Not that I think they will. I'm just you know plucking those names out because those are the kind of guys they need. That kind of play. I'm sort of thinking you this. Know, some, I'm some, thinking some this great. out loud, like saying this out loud. But I, I think it also might come into play, like who they get rid of first, like how much space they can free up. Like Robbie them. Smith, yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. That's a good example. But, but like I think Tyler Bertuzzi or Domi would cost like six million, but I'm not sure for how long. Uh, and I hear Toronto. Where's Toronto get all this cap money? I heard they want to keep both of them on long term deals. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to swing that. And well, I guess they'd have to make them really, really long them to give them to guarantee them a lot of cash. And they'd have and they'd have to uh, get rid of Marner. Yeah, let him go for sure. That would have Which to be still regret. 
Um, yeah, because you're a Everything fan of his, right? Everything wrong with the Maple Leafs is contingent on them having signed John Tavares when they didn't need him. One name that was floated out there was Jonathan Druin, who's been a Penguin killer over his career. He's been playing in Colorado with Nathan McKinnon, put up a high for points, put up a high for assists. He's I've seen him slotted anywhere in the four and a half to five and a half million dollar range. Sometimes those estimates come in high. Uh, if you were to play with Sid the same way that he played with McKinnon and kind of be a Gensel clone, that'd be great. I just don't know if he has that in him. I don't think he's ever quite lived up to that. Whereas Gensel, Erwin Struan's not at all gritty, not even remotely. Yeah, right. I mean, if you if you want to get more grit, you're not getting it from him. But then again, I mean, how much grit did you get from him? If I played against Jonathan Struan in the Ontario Hockey League. I'd be suspended. <laughs> That's a rather deep dive, but, but no, somebody out there will get it. People can look it up and uh, see what was said in the Ontario Hockey League. To, to right, make exactly. Point. Yes, exactly. Before we go to comments, Mark, let's get I to mean, one. Don't get me wrong, Tim. I'm not anti Druin. I mean, they could get worse, and I bet they do. But, yeah. but I'd rather have a Domi or a Bortuzzi, or best case scenario, the Brusque. And by the way, I did look at the uh, Alan Walsh podcast that he did online. He's his agent. And boy, he made it sound like Druin's going to stay in Colorado anyway. So that might be a short. Who's, agent? Who's his agent? Alan Walsh. Oh, uh, okay. For people who don't know, he's Flurry's agent. Same guy that had the sword in the back of Flurry and all that. So he's 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 a handful. I, of will, I will say this. I, I know a bunch of guys represented by him, not least Flurry, and they swear by him. And that's really all the cons, I suppose. Mark, uh, before two things actually I want to get to, I remember one thing and then uh, we'll, we'll get to some comments, but um, there's a national topic, one of the Penguins related topic, though, two anniversaries yesterday, the 40th anniversary of Mario being drafted by the Pens, and then on Wednesday, it'll be the 15th anniversary of Talbot's goals, Game 7, the Stanley Cup victory in Detroit. Yeah, two key moments in my hockey fandom for sure. Uh I'll never, I always tell this story. I was like working for UPI and a bunch of crappy rags besides my post gazette employment, like as a way to cover hockey. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I went to the Penguins first practice at Lebo with Lemieux, right? And my late mother was a big Penguins fan. And it was two a days, two sessions. Between the sessions, I called her to pay for it. I go, Mom, we're going to win. She goes, What do you mean? I go, This guy's unbelievable. He goes, you can tell that for one practice. I go, yeah, it's, it might take a while, and it did, but we're going to win. That's how evident it was right away. Yeah, I mentioned uh, the draft in our first call post, and that was just, I was, you know, one of those typical things. You go to find one story, and then you're 15 clicks later, you've gone on a deep dive. And right. the numbers he put up in junior, like <laughs> 238 point season in junior, or something ridiculous like that. What the numbers he put up in junior were just eye popping. And they weren't like rotten goals either. He was like scoring great goals. All the time. Yeah, all the time. He just he had them overmatched in terms of size and skill and speed. He overmatched them in every category. And when that happens, it's gonna be wow. And that was bought was that Bossy's? That was Bossy's junior team, right? Laval? Wasn't that Bossy's junior team? I think it might have gone through a name change by then, but but oh, Bossy okay. did play in Laval. I want to say that Bossy was the Wazan, and Lemieux, of course, was the Titan. The Titan, yeah, right, exactly. Um, okay, well, let's get to some comments here. Oh, the other thing, Caitlin Clark, not in the U.S. Olympic team. What are they doing? Why not? Like, why, why does the amazing have to extend to the Olympics, I guess is what I'm saying. She has more buzz than any women's basketball player in the world. She would get people to turn on the TV. They're going to win the gold medal no matter what, and they're leaving her off for gatekeeping. And it's just, it doesn't matter who the 12th girl is. You know, I saw you know, if, you want, if you want to bring her on and, you know, make her a sub off the bench, that's fine. But but being her, being there keeps the buzz going. Tim, they are well on their way to making her just another player, if that hasn't happened already. Well, I saw some people say it's good that she's not on it because it would have been a Christian Leitner thing, like with the 92 Dream Team. I don't see it at all. That's okay. That. I don't, okay. even, I don't see it as all as that. I, I think that she's better now than, than Leitner was by comp in that era with those players. Like, she's closer to the level of those players than Leitner was to those guys. Yeah, I mean, when I say she's the 12th girl, I'm using that, you know, rhetorically because it doesn't matter who the 12th woman is, but, but you know, she'd probably be closer to the 8th or ninth. All right, let's get some comments here. Eric says, Kansas City won it all in 2015. Stunk it Plus, up. One, one last thing, Tim. Yeah. 
She is, I think anybody would agree, the best three-point shooter in women's basketball, right? Yeah, she's like Steph Curry, basically. And there's always a place for that, a need for that, a situational for that in a tournament. Uh, that well, that's a good point, and that's again where it gets away from Leitner, who was you know an inside the paint player, an inside the arc player, and they had tons of those, you know, and any number of guys that they had on that team could have done that job. Well, with that team, it really didn't matter. I could have been the twelfth guy. Yeah, and you know the analogy holds up because the those guys crapped all over them, but I think they had more of a right to crap all over him than the women do with Caitlin Clark. Like she's they crap all over him. Oh, they kind of, yeah, they beat him up in practice and, you know, just, he was just kind of along for the ride. One thing that gets lost with that generation of players in the NBA, those American guys, they were a bunch of jerks. Oh, because they could afford to be, sure, yeah. No, but Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Charles Barkley, real life jerks. Malone, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Pippen. don't get me, I worked with Malone. Wait, did you work with him in that that whole thing I with him and Rodman? Him. Yeah. Oh, okay, I didn't. I didn't know if you. Yeah, guys... we compromised the NBA finals. <laughs> I know you've talked about that story before. Yeah, yeah, we got them to get in that scuffle. We told them if you guys can get in a scuffle, which will plug the pay per view, and they go, "Yeah, no problem." We compromised the NBA finals. That's never written about enough, but it's absolutely true. And what's funny is, I, 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 I worked with Rodman then, and I've run into him since. He's the nicest guy ever. He's out of his mind. But he's the nicest guy ever. I've only met him once or twice. I did interview him once when he was a Laker. I think I've met Carmen Electra more times than I've than I met Rodman, actually. I met her. I met her with Rodman. Yeah, Saw, she's her a very, Saw her in very great. She was awesome. Starting a very revealing outfit in a club we went to, a bunch of guys. <laughs> I yeah. saw her, I saw her perform in Costa Rica. Was she, remember she was doing the Pussycat dolls? Yeah, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, that's where I met her. Was I mean, utterly good? talentless, but been awesome. <laughs> and uh, but no, like I, the last time I saw Dennis was at Flair's 70th birthday party, and he approached me. I get this tap on his shoulder. I turn around. He goes, "Announce your guy," and I go, <laughs> "Basketball guy." That's me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we talked for like ten minutes. It was awesome. Uh, I, I really, and that goes for back then too. I really like Dennis. I can't say enough good about him. Uh, Eric says Kansas City won it all in 2015, stunk it up for a stretch, and now look to have rebounded. If they can do it under such terrible economic system, why can't the Pirates? Oh, I can tell you why, Eric. Because Kansas City wanted to, and the Pirates don't. Ron says Florida in five. Where'd you have the series? I thought it was going to go seven. I had four in six. Oh, you had it in six? Okay. Yeah. Right. Then again, I had Dallas and the Rangers in the final, so what do I know? Sean follows up by saying Florida may sweep Edmonton if Bobrovsky plays the way he did. Yeah, I mean, he's not going to, but, I mean, I get your your point in totality. If he's this much of a difference maker in net, it's not going to go six or seven. You know what else I realized about him, too? Every goalie's equipment is huge. His is bigger. Yeah. And how big is he to begin with? Oh, he's fairly big, right? Yeah, so, I mean... (laughs) There, there isn't a lot to shoot at with the way he takes it away. That windmill. Did he get a piece of it on that windmill save, or did he just sort of take away the net? when It he was, was hard there? to tell, wasn't it? Yeah, and I, I never really got a great replay angle of it. Um, Sean. That was follows, very hot to guess. Sean follows up by saying um, they have to pacify Crosby, Richard says. He's following up a quote from Richard who says, with the Pens, it will be the same coach, same system, same core, and likely the same results. Sean yeah, that's all true. That's Sean follows up by saying they have to pacify Crosby. How much of this is about pacifying Crosby? Not none of it. Yeah, I mean, especially it, the con- the concept of it, him not wanting change. It's more like pacifying the whole group, but yeah. Uh, Ron says... I thought the way, Tim, uh, yeah. that uh, Bobrovsky 6-2. I looked it up. Yeah, that, I thought he was pretty big to begin with. So I remember one time I said to Gar Snow... I, I asked him if he ever explored the possibility of sending the equipment out there by itself. <laughs> he didn't like that. There was a lot that Gar Snow didn't like. I think that was my first year covering the Pens was his last year here in Pittsburgh. And yeah, I don't remember him having a lot of positive responses to any questions. There was a little barrasso in him. He dated a stripper for a while that, that, that I knew that he would like, not, not when I say dated, I mean, actually dated. he would take her places. You know what I mean? She was like a girlfriend. Okay. He also dated uh, one of the other players too, but that wasn't so much taking her place. Uh, 
This is Dave. Dave says, Mary, the best hockey player of all time, in my opinion. Without the health issues, he damn well could have held all the scoring records. Without the health issues, they have a thousand goals. Yeah. Um, do you think wh- where does where does Ovechkin end up? Does he just pass Gretzky and then hang it up after that, you think? I don't know. I, I think a lot of his dinner and walk on- off like Crash Davis. He had a really good uh second half of the season. If he could get like a 40 goal season, I think he like I think the first time he gets like 17 goals, he'll hang it up. Brian says, what does Crosby's extension look like? Three years at 8.7 question mark. Didn't you? No, he's going to get more than 8.7. He's going to get more than 8.7. You told me you thought it was only going to be two, right? At one Uh, point we talked about No, no, I think it's going to be three. You think it's going to be three? Okay. I don't know for sure, but I would guess three, and I think it'll be like 11 million. Um, Jason says, why is... You know what? He's given this team a break for so long that he, he should feel no need to do it now. And even $11 million would be a break. Jason says, well, yeah, because like that's what Reinhardt's going to get probably. Right. Jake, might, Jake might get that. I've seen I've seen projections for oh, Jake God. as high as that. I think it's a little much. I, I mean, I think he's more in like the $9 million range. But. Jake was real good at Carolina. But whoever signs him better be careful because if he went to the wrong team, he would not be very good. Case in point, I'm not sure how good it'd be in Minnesota where he might go. Yeah, I've seen Minnesota. And again, I don't think there. he can go there. I talked to Garen on the show the other day, and they still have one more year of cap problems because of the uh, Parisian Suter buyouts. Did you um, – I saw something that suggested maybe San Jose taking a real run at him too. That was another one. Oh, 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 <laughs> he goes there, he'll get like 11 goals. Jason says – Then again, why don't he plays with Calabrini or whatever his name is. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Um, why is Crosby so afraid of change? He has to know this team can't win again. No, no, the, the, those three guys and the coach, they very sincerely think this is a real good team that's just running into some bad luck. I, I couldn't state that any more succinctly and strongly. He also added Gensel to Chicago to play with Bedard. That wouldn't be bad. It's not a very big line, though. They're going to need somebody on the other side to really beef it up. It'll be pretty good, though. You know, he could skate with him for sure, and he could set right. him up, too. He could set up that shot because Jake can set guys up as well as score himself. So That's the kind of line where you had, if you had Bedard, Gunstel, and a Kachuk, it would be unbelievable. Mark, before we go, how is life without Twitter treating you? Oh, it's great. Do you want it back? Are you going to go back on or no? I'd like to get the original one back, which is being held hostage. I mean, they haven't contacted me with, uh, with ransom demands or anything like that. But, yeah. Uh, I suppose I'll have to get like a, a new one just to retweet, you know, links and stuff like, you know, stories and show stuff. But I don't miss it at all. At all. I'm amazed by how little I miss it and how much I I I, I love not having the aggravation. So does Bryce Powell negotiate with terrorists or not? We played that clip from uh, Tropic Thunder on the show. <laughs> And in the meantime, go bleep yourself. Uh, yeah, that I, I, I believe that is Cruz's greatest role. Yes, well, it was for sure, absolutely. And his facials, like when he when he talks, like when he goes, he goes a hundred million. Okay, oh wait, I got a better idea. His, the way his face just pops, it's just tremendous. Mark and I will be back next week for Madden Ben's Unfiltered. We'll also be back for the Madden Monday podcast. Listen to Mark Monday through Friday. I want to- I'll have cleaned my glasses by then and. Uh, my hair will be a little better, I suppose. As courtesy of the Barber School of Pittsburgh and Alter Genius Brewing Company in Ambridge and in Imperial.